You're Lord Liu Bei, the woman said with a grimace. And you're disturbing my guests, what is the meaning of this? Liu Bei replied. His guards held on to the prisoner tightly as she wriggled a little closer to her host. I was here to see you. Apparently I'm not expected. <laughs> like coming all this way was not doing you honour enough. I was asked to wait here until morning. How could I allow myself to be insulted like that? May I ask for your name? Liu Bei motioned for the guards to release the woman. She stood and the torchlight showed her wide silhouette to be the product of well-used pieces of mismatched battle armor strapped over her tunic. Queen Zheng, it is a pleasure to meet the foremost warlord in China, she said. While Liu Bei would have resented the classification, he was taken aback by this so-called queen's metallic glare and chipped smile. Queen Zheng, I... will you come in? Been waiting, haven't I? Inside, the rough-looking guest was given a place at the table, to much scorn from the other attendees. And yet, Liu Bei asked much of her, and she replied without hesitation or concern for the reaction. There was quite a reaction indeed when she revealed that she was the famous bandit known as Lady Zheng, who had all but overthrown the Han administration in the northern mountains. I heard there was a man here who fought in the name of the people and had earned his power not through the handouts of a corrupt court, but through strength of arms. That is why I came to pay my respects to you, Lord Liu Bei. However, it seems your followers think us very different, she said. Ah, uh, well, that's one way of putting it, Liu Bei said. The guests were aghast at this benign reaction to such implications of illegitimacy. Lady Zheng soon took her leave before swords were drawn, although not before finishing her share of food and drink all at once. Why is Elder Brother giving this bandit any thought at all? We should have her killed, Zhang Fei said to Guan Yu. He seems to have been charmed, although I cannot say why. Let us sober him up before he humiliates himself. Liu Bei apologized to his court in the morning and vowed to avoid wine for a month in recompense for his loutish behavior. He claimed to have been so drunk that he had forgotten who this Queen Zheng even was. This capped off his story with a solid lie. In truth, he thought of her far more than is reasonable for a servant of the Han. Once business resumed, Liu Bei sent a delegation to Liu Yao. With Liu Yao's conspirators in Guanling now removed, Liu Bei wished to offer his kinsman a chance to reconsider his short-sighted notion of loyalty. Liu Yao sent back a message in agreement, however strangely the officials of the delegation did not return. No investigation could take place, for the Liu clan was about to have more trouble with a military woman. Her name was Tong Yu Rei, the late wife of a magistrate in Yu province, Kong Zhou. Her husband had collaborated with Cao Cao in the previous years before dying in a skirmish with the local yellow turbans. When she had received regency over Kong Zhou's army, she had made no effort to avoid becoming Cao Cao's puppet, caring not at all for military matters or anything at all in a world without Kong Zhou, it seemed. Thus, she was launched like an arrow into Chen to cover Cao Cao's retreat. Liu Bei ordered Xia Dun to intercept her, for the work was distasteful, and after all, Cao Cao had to be his first priority. He marched to find Cao's countryside headquarters in western Chen. However, Xia Dun found a puzzle when he encamped in Tong Yu Rei's path. Her army, with no baggage and bedraggled banners, marched off the road and through depopulated wilderness to avoid Xia Dun. As soon as he learned of them, Shahudun turned to pursue, enraged by the lack of common military courtesy to avoid a clear invitation to battle. As he was leaving, it was reported to him that a strange message had been secretly posted in the local villages. It read, All those who ally themselves with the traitor Dong Zhuo will be destroyed. Power will be seized by the pure. Thus says the general who crosses Yellow Heaven, her man. Tong Yu Rei was being pursued by her late husband's killer, the Yellow Turban warlord He Man of Runan. So, you sent them here, cousin, Xiao Dun said to himself. You are the general who defeats bandits indeed. My lord was simply one bandit too many. 
and now I too do bandit's work. If Kong Zhou had not bowed to Dong Zhuo, I would be better off watching clouds with the pedant Huang, wouldn't I? Sighing, Xiao Dun ordered that any local people who left their villages in response to the messages were to be executed, while he took his army to join the pursuit of Tong Yu Rei. Lady Tong ran up against a river, and the delay allowed Xiao Dun to catch up. With no other choice, she turned and formed what men she had into a battle line. My lady, allow me to handle this for you, her handmaiden Peng Jusheng said. I cannot allow that. How can I continue on without your help? Lady Tong protested. To go on, I must do this for you, my lady. I am happy to lay down my life for your family. Please think nothing of it. With this, Peng Jusheng rode out alone to put a halt to Xiao Dun's army. Her sudden wordless charge caught Xiao Dun off guard. Her axe clanked against his chest plate, sending him tumbling off his horse. Peng Jusheng jumped down and slashed at him with wild ferocity. Amid the clashing of weapons, Xiao Dun said, Matron, what madness possesses you? Go and tell your lady to surrender! How could she surrender to the likes of you? Imperial caretaker Liu Bei accepts the surrender of any who will serve the Han honestly. <laughs> you cannot be speaking of the Han who have declared Liu Bei a pretender. The Han to which loyal men like Liu Biao, Liu Yao, Kong Rong and Cao Cao rally. My lady's family has been fighting rebels for ten years, so how could we fail to recognize one standing right before us? You think scholars like Kong Rong and imperial kinsmen like Liu Biao will side with Dong Zhuo? So we have a traitor not just to the emperor, but to reason. Xiao Dun swung his spear by the butt, its full length reaching Peng Zhushang's feet and awkwardly tearing through the leather. Distracted by the pain, Peng Zhushang could not dodge the next swing, aimed at her head. Seeing her fall, Tong Yu Rei's soldiers surged forwards in anger, but Xiao Dun paid them no heed. As if he were alone under heaven, he waited for his horse to trot over to him and carefully mounted. The soldiers, despite their rage, dared not get close, and had to content themselves to recovering Pang Jusheng. Xiao Dun returned to his army, a storm of arrows turning back any would-be pursuers. Among his lines, he asked his adjutant Jian Yong, Tell me, is there any rumor that Kong Rong or Liu Biao will stand against Lord Liu Bei? Impossible! Jian Yong laughed. Why would a learned scholar or a Han scion oppose our lord? Leaving the question unanswered, the pair organized an advance. With their backs against the river, Tong Yu Rei's men could not avoid the falling arrows, nor the charging horses. By the time the Liu foot soldiers arrived, their foes were dead, surrendered, or being helplessly carried downstream by the rushing river. Amidst the chaos, Xiao Dun saw two blue-coated nobles arguing beside a horse. As he approached, the shorter of the two mounted it, helped by the taller. The rider turned and rode right at him, with no weapon drawn. It was Tong Yu Rei herself. Lady Tong, shall the madness end today? Xiao Dun called. Tong Yu Rei got almost within arm's reach of Xiao Dun before she finally replied. Cao Cao wishes to express his regards for you and your new lord. If he had known you were so treacherous at heart, he would have played the outlaw like Liu Bei just to keep you. Alas, bonds of kinship break when heaven is overturned. That is all, so you may kill me now if you wish. I only ask you spare my husband Chang and handmaiden Pang, for they are like those men there in the river. Who can blame them for where they wash up? Tong Yu Rei clicked at her horse and sidled away. Xiao Dun, filled with fury and sorrow to think of his cousin Cao, did nothing. He later accepted the surrender of Cheng Shu and the ailing Pang Jusheng, and gave no further orders to look for Lady Tong. His army retraced its steps, ready to face Cao Cao's next ploy, the Yellow Turban invasion. Earlier that day, Liu Bei got confirmation that the small, rural town he was marching to really was Cao Cao's secret court. This came in the form of an army that filed out of the small farming estate and blocked Liu Bei's path. Peering over a wide stream towards them, Cao Cao's own banner wasn't visible. He's too scared to face us, Zhang Fei said, delighted. No, it is we who should be scared, Guan Yu said. 
A Cao Cao in the flesh before you is easy to defeat, but a hidden Cao Cao is like a vengeful ghost. Although we kill his followers today, we will achieve nothing. What of the restoration of Chen Commandery? Liu Bei said. Once we are able to uplift good men and expel the bad, we will have cut the wings from the next Cao Cao to emerge. How can you call achieving that nothing? Elder, Elder brother, brother, you truly understand heaven's will, the younger brother said with respectful bows. Guan Yu rode out to the right and Zhang Fei to the left. Cao Cao's troops advanced in poor order and were easily surrounded. Guan Yu was charged by the Cao commander, Si Bao Ji, but within three bouts, Guan Yu was riding on towards the terrified foot soldiers. Liu Bei led the army forward to the stream. On its slippy banks, his troops could easily repel any attack from Cao's splashing men. Liu Bei himself leapt across the stream on his horse and rode on into the swirling mess of banners and floundering detachments left by Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. With all three brothers now racing about with bloodied blades, the chaos only worsened. Si Bao Ji's advisor, Fan Ju, was trying to organize a retreat, but Guan Yu's green dragon saber dug into his back and ended him instantly. Thus, the battle ended in the complete rout of Cao Cao's men and the fall of his last base of operations. Yet, even inside the rustic estate, there was no sign of the man himself. In a small library there was a table, upon which a bolt of white silk lay. Some of it had been torn away, and beside it was a blackened ink brush that had just barely dried. The brothers thought little of this, and focused their efforts on the victory feast. However, the torn piece of silk had made its way west to the city of Shangyang, seat of the imperial province of Jing. Attendants were dismissed, doors were closed, and it found itself in the presence of just two men. One was Liu Biao, protector of Jing and kinsman of the emperor. The other was Cao Cao. On his belt he had a collection of official seals from the imperial court, protector of Yu, of Yan, of Shu and of Yang. He removed that of Yu province and placed it aside the stretch of painted silk. The emperor begs that you will accept this gift and the responsibility that comes with it, Cao said, touching his head to the ground. Liu Biao looked from the seal to the message, then sighed. I am an old man, General Cao, he said. I wanted nothing more than to live out my days in peace and see that my sons took care of the people of Jing. Even though I was enraged by the proclamations of Prime Minister Dong, I still did not invite war upon us. Yet it arrives now uninvited at a late hour, and I am like the doorman wondering whether to wake my master for it. Please have no second thoughts, my lord, Cao Cao said. It is true that our Prime Minister is not fitting. Yet with great and loyal men like you content to watch over distant flocks, how can one more suitable ever arise? If you are truly content, then what matters it if the Emperor's fears are realized and the pretender Liu disrupts the dynasty? I have come to the wrong man, I see. Excuse my rudeness in presuming your virtue. You are a crude gentleman, General Cao. I can see why everyone calls you a crafty hero, but I thought you would see through my words. Your true intention is to unseat the traitor Dong, am I right? Only in such good company as yours could I ever admit to it, Cao said, bowing deeply again. Yuan Shu, Liu Bei, Yuan Shao, there are those who seek to replicate the success of Dong Zhuo, or worse. It is the men who would stop them, even with little hope for advancement, who must be searched out to restore the court to order. Secretly, I had hoped to meet such fellows, and finally they arrive at my gates. Liu Biao leaned forward and forced Cao Cao up. Then he took up his brush and added his name to the list of nobles on the scrap of silk, below the title Coalition Against Pretenders. The names Zhang Chang, Kong Zhou, Liu Yao and Sun Su sat after Cao Cao's own. I know exactly who we should ask next. Leave this with me, Liu Biao said. The next morning he ordered his generals to prepare Jing's armies. Cao Cao then joined his entourage for a secret visit to Qing province. 
that such malicious dealings were coiling around Liu Bei went undetected, but for a single strange portent. Prime witness to the event was Zhao Yun, who was riding to meet with Liu Bei after his victorious campaign in Guanling. He happened to take a shortcut one day, walking with his men through fields of long, swaying grass. The breeze kept the summer heat from building, so it was no wonder they encountered someone else out for a walk that day. It was a woman in noble robes, walking beside a skinny horse. She did not change course to avoid walking right into the front of Zhao Yun's marching column. Good day! Why do you walk alone? Zhao Yun called to her. The woman parted her rough hair and shot Zhao Yun a foul look. Loyal subjects are together through all time. Rebels must battle even their fellows, and so can only know loneliness. With only this horse at my side, I am like a wife to the world. Yet even with a host of followers, you are like a mouse who slips from an owl's claws mid-flight. Therefore, why do you ask me why I walk alone? Impressed at this rhetoric, if baffled by its intention, Zhao Yun asked the woman's name. Tong Yu Rei of Runan, she said, beginning to walk on past the general. Tong Yu Rei? That's the regent who sided with Cao Cao, so Xiao Dun failed to kill her, General Gao Ding said from beside Zhao Yun. She walks so freely and without care. Did that same thoughtlessness lead her into the hands of the traitors? Zhao Yun wondered. Gao Ding had matters more base in mind. If we kill her now and bring her head to Liu Bei, we'll be greatly rewarded. That will show Xiao Dun for the whelp he truly is. Come on. No, Zhao Yun insisted. You would kill an unarmed woman. What would that accomplish but mockery and derision? Enemy or not, she can go on her way. Gao Ding sulked as the pair watched Tong Yu Rei walk right past their army. Then Gao Ding had an idea. Shuffling to be just behind Zhao Yun, he made some hand signals to the soldiers. The message was passed on, and suddenly shouts arose. Hundreds of bows were drawn, and a cloud of arrows descended on Tong Yu Rei. No wait! Zhao shouted, racing forwards. Before he ordered the archers to halt, two more volleys had been loosed. Yet, before all of their eyes, both Tong Yu Rei and her horse walked on, affected by nothing but the brush of the wind. Astounded, Zhao and the soldiers checked the path she had walked, and saw it filled with arrows, sticking from the very footprints she had left in the mud. How could she have passed through? There must be some trickery at work, Gao Ding said. The arrows did nothing, like she was a mere spirit. This must be a sign from the heavens, but what could it mean? Zhao Yun asked. Regrettably, no one there was versed in divination. They quickly raced on to put some distance between themselves and Tong Yu Rei, just to be safe. This strange encounter happened on the same day that Liu Biao, Cao Cao, and a small group of confidants reached the city of Bei Hai. Inside, they met with Chancellor Kong Rong, Tong Yu Rei's son by her previous marriage to Kong Zhou. Kong Rong knew Liu Bei well, having fought alongside him during some of the worst days of the Yellow Turban Rebellion. In fact, he had once stated that without Liu Bei's aid in those battles, he would have been long dead. Whatever this weighed against Liu Biao's embassy, it was not enough. Kong Rong's name was added to the White Silk list, and with this, the conspirators were ready to declare their cause to the world and bring down Liu Bei. Could Liu Bei survive against such a union of heroes? Read on.